Hey everyone, Yoiston here, and I hope you all are doing well, wherever you are in Middle-earth. Thank you all so much for being here. I'm joined once more by Royan as we review Season 1 of Rings of Power. <laughs> Royan, how are you doing, man? I'm doing great. It's good to see all the people in the chat. Um, thank you so much for, for attending, and yeah. let's, let's get this party rolling. Awesome, yeah. So... You know, if um, I'm, I'm sure as many of you have in the chat uh, been keeping up with our reviews thus far, our most positive reviews for the season definitely were the first few. And then as it went on over the past month and a half, it's been slowly kind of in decline. Episode five was really what did it for us in terms of just like dropping from, you know, getting those, at least for me, from the, the five, six uh, out of ten range to the two, three out of tens. It hasn't really come back since. Um and every episode review, or before every episode review, I watched them right when they came out, the episodes, like Thursday night for me, which was, you know, 10 p.m. my time. Uh, they'd come out, I'd watch them, and I would put polls up on YouTube and Twitter to see what you all thought. I didn't do that for the full season because that is what we're doing here today. So let us know, just as we go through this, what you all thought, everything like that. We're going to go through a bunch of comments just as we as we make it through. And like in our reviews, we're going to just go plot line by plot line before we talk about overall overall themes, maybe some predictions. If, if we think that maybe they could save this in um, future seasons and so forth. So yeah, let us all know what you thought of the season at large. And maybe how your scores stand up. We're going to try to aggregate or get a rough aggregate of our scores. Since there were eight episodes and we're going, you know, zero, you know, zero through 10 out of 10. Every combining all of that, it's like the total score is 80, right? So if you gave the, all the episodes like a two out of 80, what is that? Then just like a, a 20 out of, no, there were eight episodes, right? So well, I'm bad at math, Ryan. <laughs> Help. Two, four, six, eight, 10, 12. What? That'd be a that'd be a 16 out of 80, right? So if you aggregate all your scores, uh, so just yeah, let us know that kind of stuff. It'll be very interesting to to see how you would rate it as a whole, how you rated every episode individually, and yeah, we're just gonna jump into it and and get started here. Bill C, thank you so much for the super chat, and you're throwing some Elvish at me. I'm I'm unprepared. <laughs> thank you. I'm happy to meet you. Yeah, yeah. Nice to meet you as well. Thank you all so much for being here. Alrighty, uh, Royan. Also, this is a spoiler review. I mean, I, I would kind of hope, <laughs> yeah. hope, hope everybody knows that. <laughs> if you're here and you want to protect your spoilers, don't be here. But... Yeah. So, Royan, would you like to start us off with the Arondir and Southlands plot line? Uh, yeah, sure. So, Arondir as a character, I think was one of the better ones in the show. Uh, he could very well be the best, actually. Now I'm just sitting here thinking about it. Mm. Um, certainly the best with the most screen time. Because some of the ones that I actually enjoyed more had a lot less uh, screen time. That's like, you know, Farazan, etc. But no. So around here's storyline, I guess, while I'm just, you know, as I'm here for the review, so I'm, I don't want to just kind of run through and summarize everything, but we start with the um, his his storyline started with a lot of thematic things in episode one. I remember talking about this was like uh, the the differences between humans and elves and how they outlooked. And he was an occupying force in the Southlands. Who you know they even stated his mission there was basically just to make sure that the these humans who had sided with with uh they had sided with uh, morgoth are not going to start any more trouble and that theme that kind of that kind of interesting theme surrounding you know the the, the evils of these these humans past and these elves today that can still find value in them for that devolved pretty quickly uh then we just kind of got into just these are the raggedy humans as opposed to the numenorians who are the the well the, the well-dressed humans. These are the raggedy humans <laughs> who are fighting against the orcs, and they're bad at it. Yeah, they did have they did have one good good victory, um, but then they lost. And Arondir, I mean, I think he's a great character, but he spent a lot of this storyline not 
really making decisions or not really making an impact. I felt like he, he, he was pretty impactful at the very beginning, uh, discovering mm -hmm. who that you, who the enemy was and all that. And then he came back to the humans and then he was just kind of like, all right, I'm going to fight them. And any, anybody else here who wants to fight can fight with me. Yeah. And then they set a trap and they did all these things. And he, he, you know, he did your pretty, your standard Elvish, like, you know, uh, he's really good at fighting, kind of a badass. But other than that, I felt like in the back half of the season, his impact on the show kind of completely fell away. Yeah. Um, yep. Absolutely. He, he was no longer, he was no longer a, a rock that diverts the stream. He was just a rock being pushed along by the stream. And it, it got to the point where, you know, they completely cut him from the eighth episode. And I think he had one scene in the seventh episode uh, towards the end where he was just with Bronwyn. And yeah, they were he, just didn't say anything. he didn't even say anything. He just nodded at Galadriel. And then they were like, all right, cool. We're done with this guy. I expect him to come back in season two, but I don't know what they're going to do with him. And because of that, I don't have a whole lot of excitement for him. Yeah. I no I and that was a like perfect synopsis of the plot and it's it's impact I I totally agree I think Arondir both the actor and a lot of the writing for the actor was perhaps the best part of the show in terms of characterization he felt the most Tolkienian to me in terms of his themes what he cared about his courage um what he was trying to accomplish one thing though about this plot line and they didn't really address it in any meaningful deeper way is why didn't the why didn't they like leave the land especially when they had time to do all of this if they knew, knew the orcs were coming and that they were ill prepared sure it's their home and i'm not even necessarily saying that they should abandon their home of the southlands of tir harad but perhaps regroup find allies in other lands come and reclaim their home in future seasons or at least attempt to we don't see any of that. They don't address why the peasants are just staying here to get killed. And that's exactly what pretty much happens in that battle is even though they take down quite a few orcs, they're just ultimately outnumbered until the Numenorians get there and then Mount Doom goes off anyway. And I do want to mention with the orcs, you know, that was a, uh, that was honestly, in my opinion, a pretty amateurish way to write that battle. It's just yeah. that, oh, and there were more orcs hiding that we didn't see die. Uh, you know, yeah, it, it, it's pretty it's it's really it really cheapens their success. Um, I think they could have done it a lot better with just because the ambush in the Elvish Tower was a successful ambush. They trapped nearly everybody there. The orcs that you see escape before the doors close and then presumably everybody dies. It's so meager in number compared to the ones that then come to the village and burn it down. Yeah. And even that group that comes in to fight and start burning is still smaller still compared to the amount of orcs that were hiding in the tree line to then come in and sweep up the, the surviving humans. So it's just, there's, there's really no, it, it's hard for me to get invested in the stakes when just the, the deck is so clearly stacked against the humans. And I don't get to know that they are actually losing the entire time. I like in well written well written stories you can feel the the impending you know you begin to to doubt uh, you know a success if it's not actually going to pan out you get to see the the hints and the cracks but in this it's just that kind of uh you know early childhood cartoons oh and then there were more bad guys and they yeah. were captured yeah no absolutely and I don't know. Like they felt, it seemed like the whole host was going up to the tower and the tower was, you know, trapped in on them and, and all of that. But we didn't really see the impact of that. Sure. Some orcs died, but like you say, if we don't know the total amount or if they're just more coming, more coming, more coming, it's like, whatever, what are the stakes? Why should we care about any of the smaller victories that our characters are having? And to tie this back around, it just does feel like through the rest of the season, almost this plot line was, somewhat abandoned it just became mordor and is like up oh, they lost and good luck to them i'm sure we'll see them again next season but for the pacing which we'll continue to touch on in these different plot lines it seems like the pacing of this show was super weird it, it, it they left some things for future seasons 
but then simultaneously in other plot lines they did like episodes worth of um advancement in the story and then like wrapped it all up at once and this is yeah certainly certainly no exception so what do you all think about this plot line we got a super chat i, I want to make sure i mention this uh thank you so much for the super chat sahediko i'm definitely butchering that name i'm sorry lesson in how not to write your protagonist my rating 16 out of 80 so yeah about two out of 10 for every episode is what i'm seeing here roughly uh that's where it averages out since i read the lore otherwise i can imagine it being three to four per episode instead but still mostly boring even for a generic fantasy though yeah the internal yeah, logic yeah, of I this agree. show yeah even if you set aside the the lore differences and everything like that which i'm far less qualified to talk about than than i feel like the lore um even if you put that aside the internal logic of this show the consistency isn't quite there the plot in so many aspects just does what the plot wants the plot to do i i don't know how bronwyn this just woman farmer and stuff how she was such a good warrior actually throughout i mean in terms of this plot line i think she i think she may have killed the most orcs maybe even more than a rondeer like that we saw i don't remember Really? I, I only remember her killing like two or three on screen and it was with a scythe. Like. Well, she she used the... I thought... How did she cut off that first orc's head in like the episode two, I think it was? How did Was that with a scythe? I thought so. I yeah. That, yeah. That, that, was, yeah, that was like the first one and that was a really awkward fight. I remember... Yeah. And I actually did like that that was... That felt like an awkward fight in somebody's small home. Yeah, yeah. Um... Like, I thought that was actually kind of well choreographed. But, no, I don't... I don't know. But y y y it gets to this point where it it kind of feels like she's... she it, Outside, looking in, it, it she's succeeding through luck. Or at least that's what makes sense. But inside, the way that they're showing it, it doesn't feel like that. So, it... It, you're right. It does feel kind of awkward that she is able to succeed in these like one-on-one -on -one fights, yeah. despite they're really having no basis for it um, or background. A Rondir is just like getting thrown around and stuff by that big orc, and then she yeah, just... that's a Rondir is like <laughs> his. So he is shown kind of you know killing orcs here and there with his bow or with his sword or whatever. But his actual like one fight that we got to see him, he's just getting. He's getting his teeth kicked in. Yeah. That <laughs> work. Yeah. No, it's, it's strange because then she just comes right up behind the orc, kills him almost no problem. And I don't, I don't know. I don't like, she got shot by those arrows. She ended up just being fine. She was walking around healing other people the next episode after the volcano went off. <laughs> yeah. And she almost died there. She was like on a, a healing deathbed almost uh, yeah but she was she was up and walking around the next episode uh and that's that's a you know greater greater theme of the show greater problem um i don't want to get too deep in this before we talk about the next super chat that came up but mm. uh yeah so dark lord grim says quote i'm a i'm gonna uh if i'm gonna be honest i enjoyed the show but i can absolutely admit that it had problems uh, like I said in some of the past reviews, if you are enjoying the show, um, mm -hmm. if you enjoyed watching the show, that's awesome. And I really, you know, I don't want to be, I'm not going to be the kind of guy who's like, oh, you, you really shouldn't be enjoying the show and here's yeah. why. If, you, if you're if you deriving enjoyment from the show, that's fantastic. You should continue to watch it. You should continue to have a great, uh, <laughs> you should continue to have a great time doing so. But um I personally did not, and that's what I'm going to talk about with my experience. I, I imagine you always feels yeah. pretty much exactly the same. Um, yeah. But yeah, like, don't, if you enjoyed it or if you didn't enjoy it, get, getting on the internet to fight about it is, is kind of dumb. Yeah. In my opinion. Uh, I, I, I have no problems with you stating your opinions and things like that. But when we start seeing bashing in the chat, is when I'm going to start using my. My new mod powers. <laughs> Fan hammer. Yeah, which I should have given you a while back, but <laughs> <That's good>. um, <laughs> Yeah, I no, I, I totally want to echo all of that, right? We're not here to gatekeep. We're not here to tell people what they should, shouldn't like, if they're real quote unquote real Tolkien fans or if they're quote unquote not real. Um one thing I would ask though is if you did enjoy it, I'd like to know why. Um and like what, you know, if, if you're hearing our criticisms of it, I would be very curious and I'd love to hear um, 
some sort of defense against these criticisms because perhaps there are things, there are deeper underlying things that Royan and I have missed. Perhaps we're wrong in some of our assessments here and would totally love to see that if you did enjoy the show uh, because this... Like Ryan said, this actually happened to be one of the better plot lines. The Iran, Deer, Bronwyn, Southlands. It's actually, even though started off for me at least being one of, if not the weakest, until the Harfoots really came in, uh, it actually, <laughs> in retrospect, became one of the best ones. And uh, and we'll talk we'll talk about that. But definitely some glaring problems here for me at least. Why why didn't they retreat? Why didn't they even talk about that? They weren't trained. They were setting up themselves for just an absolute massacre. Why not retreat past the mountains into the lands that would eventually become Gondor? Why not go north into Rovanion and seek help from other people, from other men of Middle-earth, and retake your homeland? Why not at least consider these options? How is it that some people like Bronwyn all of a sudden became relatively um, adequate fighters, even though we never saw that that buildup? Uh, how is it that all of these orcs could build tunnels and, and no one really figured that out? There are these, these more glaring problems. Uh, but Arondir in his characterization, some of the moments that he has with the other characters like Bronwyn and Theo, his courage as a Tolkienian uh, hero, even one of his first lines, the past is with us all. I'm like, this actor and the writer, or the writing, at least for this character, they understand a lot of Tolkien's themes and he's really engaging it. So for me, Arondir probably ended up being my favorite character in the end the first season of the show because he, they at least understood the tolkien stuff which makes this plot line definitely one of if not the best one in the show so although i will admit that with this plot line it came oh what was his name the kid what was the Ooh. kid's name theo 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 I, I I felt pretty much every scene with Theo was pretty weak. And it goes beyond just a child actor's uh, inexperience with the acting. Um, and yeah, <laughs> that, yeah. Whole, that whole stupid plot line with the key and yeah, the, the, sword. the sword, it's like, it felt, it felt pretty, it felt pretty generic and corporate. But yeah. Uh, and, and that's where it's like part of the disappointment in this show is that you wouldn't have, you wouldn't have to change actually like, that much to make this much better uh morgoth was the one who originally or when he was known as melkor he made mordor originally and mount doom and everything like that perhaps it would have been better instead of this whole water system and everything you have the orcs here with adar saying that since this land was created by melkor like we're trying to take it back and make this an orcish land they're fighting they're fighting and eventually sauron does return and it's through his power, it's through the creation of the ring and everything like that, that Mount Doom erupts. And he, like, his power alone recreates Mordor. And we're like, oh, crap. Like, Adar has nothing compared to Sauron. Like, there is, it's, yeah, it's just like a, a, a kid playing with toys compared to just this full-fledged adult coming in, right? So, he could have had this contrast between them. But right now, it just feels like Adar is the one who really recreated Mordor. And then Sauron's just going to come in and just take it. From I mean, or something. there will be. I, I have more problems with with Sauron that we'll get to later. Yeah, but so I but just want to make a bookmark on that. But yeah, as far as yeah, for sure. As far as Mordor is concerned and Tyr Harad, it's like they could have done that piece of that better. Especially because these characters do end up losing. Like they never really stood a chance in the first place. But we didn't know that they did or didn't. It it was really odd. Uh, still stronger than the other plot lines, though. I will say. Jacob, thank you so much for the super chat. Bill C, thank you so much for, for those. Uh, Bill says, even the devil needs an advocate. Fair enough. Uh, Jacob says, one out of five, would not recommend. I found the ripoffs of popular lines from the original trilogy to be insulting to the audience's intelligence. Uh, yeah. No, it's... Yoisin's right there with you. We talked about it last episode. <laughs> yeah. Uh... And, and it's strange, because if you're trying to do reveals, right, if you're trying to reveal Gandalf, which we'll get to, it's like you're trying to do these things, you're taking from peter jackson's adaptation versus the, the source material to reveal your character who's from the source material it's just a really strange way to do that in those moments it feels like this is an adaptation of peter jackson's adaptation of the lord of the rings it's just almost so far removed but uh western king thank you so much for for the super chat bill c uh so to this show thank you so much for the super chat and Let's see. Yeah, there was another one. Tucker. Three out of ten would be lower if not for some great CGI. 
only impressive feat is that the season being worse than Walking Dead seasons with half of the episodes. Yeah, no, the the visuals, <laughs> the vi- visuals certainly saved this. <laughs> the show is really pretty. Yeah. Like, if I, I I don't like CGI, and I've talked about that every every episode we've re- recorded, but man, is this show pretty? For yeah. Now, for the day. For, yeah, for now. We'll see how it looks in a couple of years. Um, actually, I probably won't. Being honest, but <laughs> you know, you get that, the idea. Yeah, that would entail a rewatching. <laughs> Uh, all right. All right. Do you feel like we've gotten this kind of around your Southlands? Sure. Plot? Uh, yeah. should we should we give overall ratings to the plot lines as we go through them? I didn't think about that. I don't know. I feel like that. I feel like that, that was... would be really difficult because a lot of them start to intertwine. That's and fair. So... Yeah, that's fair. Uh, yeah, we can. We'll jump on uh, real fast here. Ash, thank you so much for the super chat. Galadriel basically got catfished by Sauron. Wisest of the Noldor, indeed. They really diminished Galadriel's intelligence in this show. Yeah. Very oh, true. Yeah. It is. <laughs> that's, that's unfortunate. Yeah. Uh, alrighty. Ryan, would you like to take us into the Harfoots? Do I have to? Uh, um, <laughs> Your favorite. And the Harfoots are the worst part of the show. And it's really not close. I've seen and heard so much criticism surrounding them. That is, it, it all boils down to they are a needless addition to the show yeah. so far this not just the hardfoots but the entire stranger plot line at large has had zero impact on the greater plot of the show so far um they have no interactions with any of the other characters and if it's so far you know and this is i understand that they are going to be they're going to be building off of this in future seasons and i've already seen you know writers for the show come out showrunners come out and be like listen we are building a season two that's going to shock you and it's going to be building off of season one to be better but this is a season one rating and so uh so far the entire purpose of this plot line was so that at the very beginning of episode eight we could have a easterling uh cultist character say you are Sauron to the stranger as a, as a, an attempted catfish to the viewer, which yeah. did not land to me at all. I immediately called BS. I was like, there's no way yeah. this is, this is so fake. And it was. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And so yeah, I felt absolutely no, nothing. Um, in the first episode, I liked some of this, the Harfoot culture. I thought it was interesting, but then we continued to stay with that grueling pace. Yeah. And my biggest criticism for this entire storyline is that not only did nothing matter, nothing changed. Yeah. <laughs> nothing, nothing happens with the exception of the stranger. Uh, you know, he, that character changed, but the Harfoots did nothing. And yeah. we, they, 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 they did nothing. Nori found, they, they found the stranger. They taught him some things about being good uh in order and then and then that was it and then the cultists found him they would have found the stranger with or without the harfoots participating because they were following the the wreck of the the meteor they gave the stranger back his memories spoiler alert it's gandalf yeah (laughs) and gandalf with his memories back realized that they were evil and stopped and stopped doing them stopped doing what they wanted yeah you could I don't, I don't, you, some people might want to make the argument that because Nori taught Gandalf to be good, that's why Gandalf, uh, that's why Gandalf didn't succumb to the cultists, but they were going to give him his memories back anyway. And this is true. This, this is Gandalf. This is, this is a Maiar. Yeah. He's not, he's, he's not going to these people no matter what. Yeah. So yeah, it was, it's, it was completely cheapened plot line. I disliked it thoroughly from beginning to end. I, and yeah. I'm not alone. <laughs> no, you're not. It's... Uh, you you want to you wanna get in his? <laughs> I don't know if this is the weakest plot line thematically because they at least characterize Tolkien's themes here, but it might be the weakest in terms of just like a basic level of writing. I'm not, I'm not sure on that front, but uh, it... <sighs> It, it felt, yeah, pointless. It felt like this was in part meant to be world building. I mean, fair enough, but we didn't have to spend this amount of time but with them. 
we didn't world build anything that other parts of the story are using true not yet not yet not yet i imagine gandalf comes in by the time of the war of the last alliance in this show which is trash i'm, I'm sure i am like i i don't know what else he would do maybe he just hangs out in the east the whole time i don't know but yeah i imagine they do connect to the greater stories at some point which is whatever the this plot line again was the most boring from this writing point of view um <laughs> yeah i found myself zoning out and just wishing for these scenes to be over as they were happening. Uh, real fast, I want to catch up on Super Chats before I continue here. Good, yet, yeah. good old Halfwit <laughs> says, <laughs> to, uh, thank you for the Super Chat. No need to fear. Po Poopy is here. I mean, Poppy. Classic. Um, Bill C., thank you so much for another Super Chat. Brash, Foolish, Angry, Glad, Real C., Unfinished Tales, pages 230 through 231, beginning with So It Came to Pass. Um yeah, it could be. I w I'm not able to pull that up now, but that could be different based on based on the versions. Uh, Z Sean Sauron's theme in this show is pretty great, to be honest. It, it's nice, at least from a thematic and writing point of view. When it's like you hear that theme, you're like, "Ooh, okay." Uh, I'm hoping that it becomes more iconic if if it deserves to be. But yeah, the the themes I've been a little bit disappointed with. Some have been certainly better than others. Uh, Tucker says, I think, he, I think he means the music. Yeah. Yep. I know. Oh. Uh, like oh, some sorry. of the, no, you're good. Some of the music is better than others. Other, for, uh, other songs for sure. I, I like the cause of doom for instance, but some of the others are somewhat more forgettable. Uh, Tucker. Thank you so much for the super chat. Balrog reveal would have been impactful had it not been spoiled in the trailers. And that's the thing is that whole Balrog reveal, which we'll get to was purely for the trailers. It feels like, because that actually did nothing in this season uh, intrinsically so yeah I th it, it, it did feel like kind of just a marketing ploy so far we'll yeah. see if they do anything with it and it, and if they do and do do anything with it they are you know way before that I mean, it just feels like you know the downfall of moria is it feels like they were living there for like a month at this point yeah <laughs> <laughs> simultaneously a month and like a thousand years <laughs> The the Harfoots, uh, thanks to Bill C, the Harfoots prevented, um, despite being small, from the dis seduction of Astari that did befall the Blue Wizards, foreshadowing the role of hobbits to make a difference. It's it's tough because how established are the Astari at this point? We have the word apparently in Quenya already, and it's like, oh, in your tongue, this roughly means wizard. It's like, okay, well, what does that mean, right? What is a wizard? It, apparently they already know what that means or i don't know um nori stumbles with his name on on lauren i i don't think he did he give his name a lauren i don't think so because no, that would have yeah. been a that would have been a pure I, I don't know if they even have the rights to that name to be honest tim jones thanks for your super chat the show has ups and downs but it's mostly not tolkien for me but you know not all who wander are lost want to go into the second season open-minded thanks for everything you do Thank you again for the chat, and, and thanks for the, the nice comment. Appreciate it. I, I agree. I'm hoping that we'll talk about this a bit later, but maybe the future seasons can at least turn the rest of the story around. I don't know how much they can come back to help this story. <laughs> uh, Sadiko, to me, it looks like they didn't have any more ideas for Harfoots besides the initial, we need hobbits in this show. It's the weakest one for sure. Yeah, I think from a baseline writing, it might be the weakest. From a thematic line, we'll get to the dwarves and elves, but I think from a thematic sense and a Tolkien sense, they absolutely butchered the elves and dwarves. But from just a basic writing scenario and standpoint, I think they, uh, yeah, no, the Harfoots were really absolutely rough. And it's for the reasons you say. It's just like they didn't know what to do with them. Quick interjection here. Um Samwise Gamgee in the chat mentions that uh, they may they, they do have rights to the name Aloran because mm. Gandalf mentions it to Faramir. Uh, I think that is actually correct. Although I still don't think he mentions that. Listen to her speak the names of the tree. Oh, did she actually? Wait. I missed that. If he did, it, I'm just now I'm reading Bill C's super chat. Whether or not Nori mentioned that name. Um, I completely oh. missed that if, if they did. Yeah, me too, if if they did. Interesting. I Let me know if that's the case, because I know he calls Gandalf Mithrandir, but I don't know if he... Because uh, Aloran is his true va uh, like Valar-given name, right? That's his Valoran name, I should say, um, as a 
as one of the Maiar. So I'm not sure if we got if we do have that, but let me know if, if there's a specific quote that anyone can throw in the chat if he does tell Faramir that in the books. But that's that's curious. Yeah, it's uh it's tough, you know. Do they have the rights to the complete Lord of the Rings or only the appendices from Dianza? Uh, I think it's I've heard just the appendices too, so even if he says it to Faramir, maybe they don't have the rights to the full Lord of the Rings. I'm not sure to be honest. And yeah, so sorry, we've been we've been reading through the chats as well. Uh, I asked how you all would rate the season. I got I saw a lot of like 2, 3s, 4s out of 10s. Definitely some higher ones, but those I saw a lot of 3s out of 10s, I think. <laughs> uh, let's see. Z Sean, I'm confused. Why did they even show the Balrog marketing purposes like Royan said? Dylan King, House of Dragon is greater than Rings of Power. Totally agree from a writing point of view from an adaptation point of view i may granted i haven't read that source material just disclaimer there i haven't read the um is it the bl fire blood, and blood yeah blood, fire and fire. And blood yeah fire and blood i haven't read that so maybe if i had that would be rougher but from a writing a pure writing point of view it's it is definitely a lot better so um yeah the harfoots there's not a ton to say about them because Overall, the Harfoots didn't do a lot for the plot of the show, except slow it down, except like throw something into the machine to just clog it up. And it's too bad. We have this whole gathering of the fellowship moment at the end of season or uh, episode seven, where they're all like, I will go with you and I will do this. And then immediately they just get to their destination. Immediately they're just there to fill. I, I think they're trying to mirror Frodo sam mary pippin because there were four once again that came with uh it was a poppy that or nori rather that came with nori to uh to find gandalf and it just yeah it falls it falls pretty flat let's see joshua thank you so much for the super chat i'm very happy not to see our guys teleporno and no way since they've butchered all of our favorite elves in gilgalad slash elrond and Celebrimbor. oh Dude, I will. I have things to say about the. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, we'll get there. Um, obviously, Teleporno is uh, is Celeborn. I can't remember. Is no way. That's Kirdan. I want to say. Uh, You're right. Let me just make sure. Yeah, that's Kirdan. They they uh, they have put out casting calls, I believe, for Kirdan, who will appear in season two. So. Yeah. Yeah. No, nothing for Celeborn uh, yet that we've seen, but uh, JJ. Uh, my question is: Will Kirdan end up with? with his ring or are they just going to give that to Celebor Celebrimbor maybe Celeb and then Celebrimbor gives it to uh to Gandalf maybe well the way that they've characterized um Celebrimbor so far it feels like he would never give up his ring uh willingly yeah but yeah I don't know we'll uh, see uh real fast before we move on JJ thank you so much for yours this show has been truly terrible and I'd like to thank you for remaining honest in your reviews watching this travesty unfold alongside you guys was something I look forward to every week thanks yeah thank you so much for watching if nothing else reviewing it with Royan was <laughs> was one of the highlights of the week and highlights uh with this show I if if we weren't doing these reviews yeah I, I wouldn't have watched the show I wouldn't have finished it I would have watched but maybe episode one and that would have been it for me uh so there's that but j uh j soap 63 thank you so much for your super chat do you think Sauron was honestly hoping to have galadriel as his queen could it have been a deception i'd vastly prefer the latter but i'm mostly i'm mostly likely wrong on that and i absolutely love the idea we'll get to that more but for now i'll say that i think he was being honest because if he wasn't he could have let galadriel drown he could have killed her on the boat he could have done a, a number of things to to make Galadriel not a problem for him anymore. But he chose to save her. He chose to help her. He could have drowned her at the in the last episode in the river. He could have, because he left her there. He could have just you know held her face in the water like something Gollum would do, and then just that would have been it. Uh, he could have done a, a score of things to end her, who's been his biggest like antagonist, Sauron's biggest antagonist. And uh, he didn't do any of that. So I imagine he, yeah, he was trying to probably, probably marry her. Uh, all right, last super chat before we jump into final thoughts on Harfoots and then the next one. So, Sadiko, uh, we have the rights solely to the Fellowship of the Ring, Two Towers, Return of the King, the Appendices, and the Hobbit, Payne says, one of the showrunners. Thanks so much. Yeah, thanks for clearing that up. I was even curious about that as well. So, um, 
Yep. Okay. Yeah, the Harfoots, not much more to say about it, but it was it was disappointing. It was kind of boring. <laughs> or very boring. And it's too bad that they revealed Mithrandir in this way. I think the whole Meteor Man plot line, they could have done away with this, the Harfoots, the cultists all oh, together, yeah. and then made the other plot lines far stronger with that time. And it would have actually made the show a lot better. The cultists, before before we move on, yeah, the cultists were almost nothing for this show they like yeah, they they yeah. burned the hardfoots but they recovered immediately yeah um <laughs> yeah <laughs> they 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 fought they they killed sadek but then as i mentioned <laughs> a few last night sadek then got up and basically <laughs> did a jig and a dance before he actually decided remembered that he forgot that he needed to die yeah and then he died <laughs> oh that's right i got stabbed <laughs> oh, i'm gonna watch the sunrise though really fast i can do that yeah uh, we didn't, I forgot to talk much about the cultists yesterday in our episode eight review, but the cultists were so weird in this show. They just show up and we're like, is that Sauron? I even thought in the trailer uh, two months ago or whatever it was that that the main cultist was Sauron. Come to find out that these three women are, uh, Easterlings or yeah. of some, some sort. They're, they're from Rune. They're from Rune. Is the assumption. Yeah. Yeah. I think you're right. And so, and, they speak Quenya for a reason. Oh, I didn't even think about that. Yeah. How do they... How? Yeah, what? Why I, do they speak Quenya? I don't know. How do they have such <laughs> um, such easy magic, easy access to magic? I have no idea. And then they just turn into like a, a butterfly or whatever, the moth, that when, when they were dissipated to look like Nazgul even. And they did. They did look like wraiths with crowns. So that was weird. Which is um, weird because I'm like, I doubt he's forged those rings yet. We know he hasn't forged, uh, Sauron hasn't forged the one ring yet. So how, how could they be Nazgul? I don't know. <laughs> it's, I, again, I don't know anything that was going on. And the things, the things that I do understand felt cheap. The things that I, I want to know, there's not a whole lot of hope that I'll ever get to learn. And so that's, you know, it's, it's these smaller kind of nitpicks that just come together but there's so many of them and there's no relief and so all of it kind of culminates into this hardfoot plot line just being a complete drag from beginning yeah. to end i think it's easily the weakest of the show i agree i feel like it was unneeded unnecessary and it I mean, I remember in the lead up to the show being most nervous about the Meteor Man plotline. And I was I was right about that, as it yeah. turned out. It is <laughs> yeah. the dumbest plotline. And it, the Harfoots, man, I just, if they cut all of this, I feel like the show, they, they could cut everything that had to do with the Harfoots, leave all of that out. It would be a shorter show. And I think for it, a better show i think it would yeah. get a higher rating totally. not just from me but from a lot of people yeah a lot of people who aren't even fans who are just feel like the slow the show is slow and boring it's because <laughs> we have these constant whiplash going back to the harfoots who are doing nothing again yeah yeah <laughs> so yeah absolutely uh cool well i i agree i think everything could have gone up if they had been modified or changed but Finally, we can <laughs> put the Harfoots behind us for now, for uh, for season one, <laughs> which I've been wanting to do since I first saw them on screen. <laughs> and uh, we'll jump into, there it is, Durin, Elrond, Celebrimbor, Gilgalad. <laughs> now, I asked Royan, I was like, should we use this this uh, image of Elrond yes. talking to Durin? And Durin saying, give me the meat and give it to me raw. And I said, and, and yeah, I mean, what did you say, Ryan? What did you say? <laughs> Man, they wrote it. They like, wrote and it. There's no way they wrote that line innocently. They had 15 writers working on this show. They're constantly butting heads, I imagine, in the writer's room. And there's no way nobody there was like, hey, guys, this is a sexual innu innuendo that feels yeah. awkward. And, no, they, they saw this and they were like, yeah, this is funny. Let's put it in. Yeah, this is this is Prince Durin, the heir of Durin the Deathless, the heir of the dwarves of Khazad-dûm, the first right heir of the first father of the seven houses of the dwarves, uh, who has built perhaps at this time the grandest kingdom in Middle Earth, uh, Khazad-dûm, and has is of a people that has created artifacts grander than anything except some things that the elves have built themselves. 
And he says this line, give me the meat and give it to me raw. I can tell that they, the show writers don't take this show seriously. I can tell that if they don't take it seriously, why should we, why should I take it seriously as, as a Tolkien fan, as a writer, if they don't take rings of power, if they don't take their own world and story seriously, why should I? Uh, I think for me personally, this is the most infuriating plot line. Uh, Galadriel and, and Sauron, which we'll get to later, that one, that one's rough too for me, absolutely. But because they took the friendship of Elrond and Durin, which at moments was the best part of the show, and at moments could have been something even more special, they took it and they reduced it. They took Durin and made him a liar, even about something like a table, but he lied and said that this is something that they... This was stone that they absolutely cared about and that this was important to the dwarves and all of this kind of stuff. And whatever, he was just lying because he wanted a new table that he stole from the High King of the Elves. It's supposed to be this innocent joke, but it made the Prince of the Dwarves a liar. We have Gilgalad who, you know, tells Elrond to break his oath that he made to the dwarves, even though the whole last age was full of, of oaths broken and unbroken, or rather mostly unbroken, that led to such torment and evil. But, like, oaths are such a serious thing, and oath-breaking is just as serious. And, uh, so all of this. So, yeah, we're gonna, we have the, we have this as our, as our image, <laughs> because that's how they chose to write this. Uh, really fast, Ryan, I, I fell behind on the Super Chats, so. Go for it. Uh, to our community, I'm not sure who this is from, but thank you so much. To our community, I hope in time we get a show that's packed, that's picked up by someone with the love, care, and know-how for Tolkien's works. Cheers again for reviewing this show each week. You too, it's been a blast. Thank you so much for watching. That means a lot. Um, I'll, I'll run back here, but Ion Lucas, thank you so much. Do the Sindar elves become enlightened if they're exposed to Mithril? That's a good question, and I, I couldn't tell you. I don't you. <laughs> think so. I, I, don't, I don't think there's any reason in the, the, the actual lore to even believe so. And even in this show, I don't think so, because Elrond was holding on to that little shard of mithril for a long time and he mm -hmm. still is just kind of slowly figuring things out after everybody else yeah well so in the show it's or sorry in the in the books and the lore obviously the mithril thing is just something that the show made up but in the books it's like saying if if an elf came across right luthien since she beheld one of the silmarils does that make her a high elf i would say no even though she was exposed to the light of the two trees of the Va of Valinor from the Silmaril, doesn't make her a high elf because she didn't see the light of the two trees them itself. Uh, so I would say same thing here. They're not really high elves, but I think in the show it's trying to say that they that I think the Sindar actually would infuse that within themselves and become like high elves or at least stronger. They don't need to diminish. They don't need to fade. Um, it's a good question, but Zeeshan. We all know a nice sunrise heals all stab wounds. <laughs> hundred, hundred percent. Next time I but it did it. No, yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> that's true. At least he died a little bit happier, I guess. I don't know. Uh, Tammy, why are the Harfoots so dirty? Surely, so surely they would have wandered near a lake at some point. Love men in the West, by the way. Thank you so much for the support. Nah, no, they they weren't uh, at every, the Hobbit phase of cleaning yet. Yeah. Every every character in the show that's not an elf. You, uh, actually, some of the drawers are kind of clean, but like even the Numenorians, if you look at like their fingernails and look up, they're all so dirty. <laughs> everybody's mm. everybody's so dirty. Nobody's got baths, and you know, and nobody cares. I, I, <laughs> like, I think that's just a choice. Um, whatever. Yeah, it's like they don't even care about taking a bath. You know, you have the later hobbits who are just like all quaint and these little gentle folk. But Harfoots, man, they're just slugging through the dirt and the mud. I love it. Uh <laughs> and Bill C went back. He he graved episode eight again. Yeah. Minute fifty two. You are wrong about your name, or lion. <laughs> and yes, she gets it backwards. All right. So wow. they did drop they did try to drop Gandalf's actual Meyer name. Why? Wonderful. <laughs> Why is he in the show? I, I, well, and this is interesting, Ryan. I, I think I saw a comment like earlier this morning someplace that said maybe they're putting out like a trial balloon to see what the audience thinks. Because if they like that this is Gandalf, then they'll keep it. Because it's like, oh, we've only said a couple of the lines and it's like, oh, this is Gandalf. But if fans absolutely hate it, they would just change it and say, oh, this is like a blue wizard or some someone that like, uh, 
who also said similar quotes to Gandalf, but it's somebody else. But no, this this but, now is, yep. seems to be more evidence towards this exactly. being a Lauren. So exactly, I don't know. Cool. Never mind. Uh, so yeah, what are your thoughts with Durin and Elrond? I I kind of jumped in and started. Okay, there is one more super chat that I want to get oh. before I get there. Uh, Isaac Caven says, "Hey, I love your channel so much. I'm sorry oh. you hate the show, which I love <laughs> so much, but I totally get it, and I will." I will start watch both as a Tolkien fan. Like I said earlier Thanks, on Isaac. the show, if you're enjoying the show, don't stop because I didn't. Um, you know, I, I I I I do envy the people who are enjoying the show. You know, because they are just they are just getting more enjoyment out of their time than I am, and that is something to be envied. Not uh, yeah, <laughs> or not envied, but it's something to be celebrated. I think, but yeah, no. Uh, also, we just got one from Corey Cassell. Correction: Luthien was higher than a high elf, daughter of Melian. So she, so you're right. She was a she was a Maya, but she was half Teleri or Sindar, and she was half um, Maya. So you're right there, but she still wasn't technically like a high elf. Uh, By our definition of a high elf uh, is she... so yeah is uh, our definition of a high elf. Uh, that's a great point. So uh, the Calaquendi, the high elves, are the Vanyar. The Noldor and the Teleri of Alcalande, the Terry, the Teleri of Tol Erisea. So, there anyone who went to Valinor and beheld the light of the two trees themselves? I don't think it passed on to their descendants. It's it's a little bit tough because with the Noldor, it's like kind of. But I wouldn't consider um, Elrond, for instance. I wouldn't consider him to be a high elf either, but a descendant of high elves. Technically Luthien, because Thingol was the only Sindar elf to have seen the light of the two trees in Valinor, you could consider her to at least be, you know, the daughter of a high elf. But, um, but no, no, that's a that's a good correction to bring up. Thank you, thank you for saying that. So okay, now I'll give you my thoughts. Yeah. So at, early on in the season, um, this this storyline between Elrond. And, and that elf dwarf relationship was, I think, the best part of the show. Um, there are so there were some some kind of you know red flags coming up surrounding the theme, specifically Elrond's characterization and how he has changed. But I still really really enjoyed these two actors' chemistry. I enjoyed the the, the kind of banter that was written between the two, and I I just really loved the way that Elrond, the character in this show, acted. Uh, around basically all the dwarves. I also loved, um, I, I loved, uh, <laughs> I loved Moria. I loved that. God, Casa Doom was. It was so pretty. It was so great. There were some things that you know, minor knots that I really disliked. But then everything fell apart in like episode four when they went to Linden and they teleported to Linden, yeah. which was annoying. But um, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like. <laughs> Then they get there and they have the most awkward dinner on earth with, with like, there's like eight people there. Three of them are talking. <laughs> um, and two of them are just actively like w fighting each other. Almost. It felt like, um, and man, it was, it, it just kind of really went downhill from there. The, entire thematics surrounding the mithril plot was both unfounded poorly executed because you have so much mithril shown and yeah. there was this entire manufactured conflict that literally got durin banished from his home and in the end, all they needed was just that little nugget shown in episode three. Exactly. No, that they had it the whole time because Durin so just gave it to all them. of it was pointless. There was no, no. There was no after like the the fourth episode. This plotline, there was no more fun to be had. Yeah. My the greatest crime was what they did to my poor boy Gilgalad. Yeah. And he he will have more more impact on the initial parts of Galadriel's story. But here, Gilgalad is one of my favorite characters from the Legendarium. I love everything about Gilgalad. And I was so excited to see him on the screen. But every scene he's in, from the beginning to the end, he is an antagonist of this show. He, he basically banishes Galadriel for no reason. Yeah, He is constantly 
putting pressure on Elrond to just be a, ba- a be a worse person. And yeah. <laughs> at the end of it all, he couldn't even stick to being an antagonist because in the eighth episode, they have him show for the first time in the series, just a semblance of a clue of what's going on when he refuses to, to hold a crown that would give him dominion over, you know, all life. And yeah. that you, you didn't earn that character did not earn from me anyway, the respect that the show wants me to give him to be like, Oh no, Gilgalad is a good guy because he, there was no reason for him to say that in the first place. Yeah. Uh, no, was, you're, yeah, you're totally It was right. really, really frustrating. And that is a case study of a lot of characters that just, they don't have not even just the lore characters, but the, even their own, original characters in this show they do not have progressions in their actions and their thoughts and their storyline they simply change what they want or what they do based on what the based solely on what the writers want to do next yeah yeah exactly there's no they don't feel like real people they don't feel like real characters i think that's one thing that house of the dragon definitely has over um rings of power is the characterization you know watching certain characters die in that show is like actually kind of heartbreaking in this show it's like oh a hobbit got stabbed or oh galadriel got banished or ah whatever cool and and while while this is still topical with what we're talking about bill c put a super chat out a bit ago could the tree dying be real elves dying a lie all by sauron and that is something that a lot of people are talking about like could sauron this whole uh, disease in the tree be just kind of an uh, like a fake by Sauron that is just kind of putting pressure on the elves. Now, the major theme in Tolkien's work is that the elves are constantly diminishing throughout time. That's huge. That's, you know, that's just in the background. And I do think that that is real. The tree dying as a representation of that is an interesting choice in the show, but I do not think that it is a fake by Sauron. Because as we see, mm-hmm. Sauron is occupied at this time. <laughs> yeah. He is elsewhere, and he is not being shown off as an all-powerful, you know, uh, like, person that he is, that he can pull off this this hoodwinking from forever away. Because, yeah. well, he's, he's busy almost drowning for some reason. Uh, yeah. And I'll talk more about Sauron and my problems with that character later. But I think... Yeah. Hopefully that is enough of an answer for you there, Bill. Um, You're completely right. I mean, absolutely right. We see the the leaf in Casa Doom when you know Durin throws that piece of mithril in the leaf. We see that it does have a healing effect and a healing factor there. Apparently, this tree in Linden, this great tree that Gilgalad references, um, is symbolic of the elves at, at large. But they didn't set that up. I okay. No, they um, just dropped that in episode yeah. four. They're like, oh, by the way, here's this tree yeah it's it's dying but it's like well also (laughs) trees die like unfortunately that does happen trees do die so how is this symbolic of all elves how do we know that they don't talk about that they don't talk that this you know they don't say this tree was given to us by our lord finwe as a way to you know measure our sustainability in arda or whatever right they don't talk about that at all uh from my memory so it's weird. Uh, real fast, Alex Grimes says, I want to clear this up. Nori did not say Aloran. She said they were wrong about your name or lying. Wrong uh, about your name or lying. So maybe that's, as in they were either wrong or lying that your name is Sauron. Um, so then maybe that's what it is. I, I would have to go back and check um, to really know. Let's see. Uh, Didier Nicole has a super chat. I was hoping for a political thriller in a region. On one side, an adventure in the Southlands and some good guys fighting against the rise of Sauron's influence among the tribes. Uh, the first season of Game of Thrones. That would that you know that's a better show than what we got. Uh, <laughs> we didn't get a lot of po- politics in Oregon. In fact, Oregon only appears in like three episodes. Um, yeah, and there's no all the arguments that characters have surrounding this plot line. There's never it, there's never a doubt on what's actually going to happen next uh that's that's another writing issue it's like even even when elrond is arguing with gilgalad on whether or not they should continue first whether or not they should begin the search for mithril to save elves or 
in the eighth episode finished the search, at no point am I ever disabused of the notion of what's going to happen. At no point do I ever feel like that, you know, that either of these choices could occur. I know for a fact where the plot's going, that the Gilgalad is going to force Elrond to work or, you know, try to work with the dwarves or steal from the dwarves to find a way to save the elves. Or in the eighth episode, at no point am I ever disabused of a notion that they're ever not going to craft these rings. It's just, there's no thrill with this yeah. uh, storyline. <laughs> And and you're missing some essential characters uh, to do such a type of thriller. I mean, Celeborn was in Regian for a good chunk of time, as was Galadriel in the lore. Like, they actually moved there for a time, as did their daughter. It's like, we actually have these bigger essential characters that they could have played with in that area, but no. <laughs> but no. Host says, Gilgalad will literally have to do a 180 character in order for the last alliance to happen. Absolutely agree. Gilgalad is not just... Uh, you know, a high king of elves. He's the high king of the elves at this yeah. time. And he basically, through his influence and his decisions, saves the realm. Yet at this point, he's acting as an antagonist. And that really frustrates me. Yeah, same here. Uh, Bill C, the flaws in the elves are exaggerated because without the rights to the first age, the often terrible actions of elves are compressed into this age alone. Totally. So, so maybe, maybe that's what it is, that they just haven't learned any lessons from the past. And that's that touches on a bigger problem that I have with this show that I've said. It's like, we don't know when we are or where we are. Oftentimes we don't know the proximity of things. Galadriel could ride with Halbrand, a wounded Halbrand from uh, Mordor to Oregion in six days without stopping for some reason. So, okay. I guess that shows the proximity or the speed of the horses because the horses probably needed a rest, but whatever, right? Proximity is weird, but then time is weird because you have, uh, the forging of the rings. So, okay, that grounds us in about 1500 of the second age. But then you have the Numenorians being, uh, you know, starting to fall. You have our Farazan, Elendil, all of that. So that pl places us in about 30 to 60 of the second age as well. And then you also have the fall of Mordor, which places you in about the first couple hundred years of the second age. So we are simultaneously at multiple different parts of the second age. And I wondered if maybe they were doing a Witcher season one sort of thing where it's like they are showing us... <laughs> a couple different times at the same time and then all of a sudden we find out that these are ages or like hundreds of years apart but then all of a sudden galadriel shows up in mordor or whatever and these these plots twist together and i'm like okay also the meteor man falling from one plot line to another plot line uh in episode one where it was like the meteor went over gilgalad and then it went all of that i'm like okay so we're in the same time zone like time frame so it's tough we don't know how to contextualize this show ever uh, we don't know what lessons they've learned, what they haven't learned. Is El Elrond says he's not an elf lord, or somebody says Elrond is not an elf lord. And I'm like, well, if he's not, then no one else is, because his father literally saved the world with his mother and went to Valinor. So if he's not a lord, who is? Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, that, that, and that plot line immediately got dropped. They were like, oh, we're going to try to do something here with half-elves, and yeah. they're, you know, maybe do, uh, like, a like a, a theming around the the disrespect between Elrond and his contemporary elves. And then immediately they were done with that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, PLU said, uh, thank you for your super chat. With the Mithril keep elves alive plot, Legolas would have pulled a Bilbo on Frodo when he reveals his shirt after being stabbed by the troll. Yeah, no, he totally would have been like, that is mine. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely absolutely that it changes or, you know, he would have mentioned me like hey man can i it's like this is just optimization of the party like if you give me that i get a i get a passive <laughs> bonus to my health points <laughs> it's yeah we're just trying to we're just trying to optimize the party that's all yeah it's like <laughs> yeah that's totally right that's hilarious um instead of elrond and durin yeah. this is another super chat from elif uh it's a cool movie. I my bad. That one, that one's on me. Dude, that was I, awesome. I don't know. How I don't know. That. <laughs> Instead of Elrond and Durin, they could uh, tell Caleb Brimbor and Narvi in the West Door of Casa Doom. That is an excellent idea, yep. but we don't know who those characters are. In this, we need the Elrond name. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, how are we gonna sell this? How are we gonna sell this? A uh, Narvi? Uh... No, no. Realistically, um, I do like that idea, but more. I do think that Elrond was 
that, that this character exists because it is a familiar face. And I do, you know, everything that I've been complaining about with this storyline, I have to, I have to caveat all of this. I think I really liked the character Elrond that they gave us. I understand that that is not applicable to the actual Elrond in the lore. And I know that Yoisin really, I, I, at least at the beginning, I remember Yoisin really not liking that change that they made to Elrond. But yeah. I have to admit that this character of Elrond, I really like. Um, so I am glad that he's in the show. But I am sad that he's part of the storyline, which makes no sense and it's really annoying. Yeah, no, it, it is like his. It, it's one of those things, right? Where if this wasn't Elrond, I would like this character. If this wasn't trying to be another character, uh, because I do like that friendship that he has with Durin. But how? Yeah, again, what what did we do? Why is Elrond the one that's the friend, not Celebrimbor? Celebrimbor being the friend of Narvi and, and this, that would have made far more sense because Celebrimbor loved the dwarves because he loved that they were, um, that they were like engineers, that they built things. Like They could even yeah. have Celebrimbor act as the friend of Galadriel without, with that making slightly more sense than Elrond being yeah, her friend. Yeah, absolutely. Because Elrond's, right, El, Elrond's the son-in-law. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, that's such a weird thing. Unless, uh, unless they pull like another Celeborn on us and they're like, Galadriel says, well, my daughter, this is my daughter Celebrian that you've never met before. Uh, audience, right? Where she mentions Celeborn just out of nowhere. Maybe they do that with Celebrian because that is so weird that they are friends. And if Celebrian yeah, no, has not the, been born yet, that- the imp Yeah, you know. the implication is that Elrond now is like, not just, you know, a grown elf, but a, a huge part of elven culture long before Celebrian is even- which is kind of weird yeah in my opinion yeah even Awkward. even about elven culture that's kind of like if it were an elf versus a man right arwen was alive for thousands of years before aragorn ever was but that's that's different that is literally different <laughs> uh different species at that point exactly yeah exactly races. exactly um so yeah we'll we'll start to wrap up this plot line here Bill C says, uh, thank you for your super chat. If Sauron could track Galadriel to the sea, wound himself, and heal, could he not have planted the seed of blight before his accident at sea? Even Aloran feared coming to Middle-earth due to Sauron's great powers. So, I see what you're talking about here, but this is assuming a lot. This is assuming so much. And and not, I'm not, like, saying that this is a bad comment, but this shows how bad the show's writing is. Because you could be right. All of these things could have happened off screen and then they could just say, oh, well, isn't this a cool story that you never saw? The thing about Aloran fearing to come to Middle-earth due to Sauron's great powers, we don't know if that's the case in the show because they're changing everything. The show, with the show's changes, it's a really weird wedge for an excuse. They say, oh, well, no, this is how it is in the book. We're just adapting that. If they if they like it, if it's something good. If it's something bad, uh... Or, or like if the right, if their indiv individual writing is something bad that the book's version is so much better with, it's like they could, you know, come up with a different excuse. They could say, oh, well, that's not the story or we don't have the rights to that or we're doing whatever. It just feels like the, the media around this show is very excuse based. It feels like it's like, oh, well, we're not doing the unfinished tales because we don't have the rights to the unfinished tales. So stop whining about it. But then it's like, well, then why did you choose the second age at all? If you didn't have the rights to the second age and then they say, oh, well, this is our own story and, and it's going to be good. It's just, it's, it's too bad. Maybe I've been on Twitter too much recently. <laughs> <laughs> all right. I think people get our, yeah. our gist here with this storyline. So let's move to uh, what do you want to do next? <laughs> Numenor? Yep, we've got uh, Galadriel and the horse plot. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but yeah. I do want. We did want to show this. We did want to show this once again. They, they Not too long though. It's, it's gonna give me nightmares. <laughs> yeah, they did. They did shoot this. Uh, the scene here, and hopefully the actress was like having fun and everything. But so like, they put this into a television show, and that's what I mean. It's like if we come after this it being in the television show, it feels like there are excuses made for this kind of quality being in a m hundreds of millions, a billion dollar show. Why? W what's the quality control here? Is there quality control? Yeah. And I want to be clear here. This is not just a half second screen cap of <laughs> an image that the internet is memeing. This is sat on the screen for like five seconds. And 
I was talking to Yoisin before we began recording about how this could have been done better. Even if they wanted to show Galadriel smiling, which, you know, could could very well be the first time we see Galadriel, the character, smile in this show. This was, what, episode five? Um, yeah. <laughs> constantly got a scowl on before this. Like, it's... You didn't need to go that slow motion, that zoomed in, in order... It's just it's there, we've reached the uncanny valley and then we just kept going. It doesn't look like a human anymore. Yeah, and it's it, it's really startling and unsettling, and it's just you know, it's just a couple seconds in the show. Yeah, but like it it stuck with me all this time. Yeah, no, absolutely, absolutely. There are moments, and since we're transitioning to the Numenor plot, we can bring this up as well. There are moments where the choices made for the writing and the direction of this show were so weird. In Numenor, we have multiple instances of them using language that is not befitting of a Tolkien adaptation. Anything with the Lord of the Rings name on it. You have, uh, what episode was it? It was when they introduced, I've got my notes here. Yeah, here we go. Episode three. Asildor said, nah. He said, nah, you go. Nah. With a W. <laughs> yeah, or like an N-A-H or whatever. Nah, you go. Nah. Nah. Wow, what is the writing here? What is the the quality again, quality control? This is a billion dollar show. Seasons 1 and 2 are a billion dollars I want to say together in their budget. Where did that go? It, I don't know if it went to the writing because the writing doesn't show that quality. It didn't know if, don't know if it went to the direction because the directing doesn't show that quality. Uh I think it all went to visuals to be entirely honest because that's the only one that reflects really high quality. <laughs> Uh, yeah uh bill c's just you know so many super chats for bill yeah. c. thank you so thank much, you so much. Um, i'm gonna try to catch up here i agree too many reveals often stretch thin <laughs> <laughs> nice like like not enough butter <laughs> yeah <laughs> i like it <laughs> um and this next one uh some blame must go to the tolkien estate for plots this is actually a good point i believe it was reported that tolkien estate had complete veto power um I am confused on, on how that would work or how that did work then. Um, if the Tolkien estate did watch this and go, yeah, man, we, we're cool with this. This rocks. We're, we rock with this. Yeah. I, I am disappointed in that because there are a lot of changes that I felt were unnecessary, not good enough to like the, the story that they made with the change was not, was not good enough to warrant the change in the first place. So yeah, I it I guess there is some blame that goes to the yeah. Tolkien estate. Um I, I personally would also like to blame the Tolkien estate for allowing this to happen. But <laughs> Yeah. That's that's yeah. just me. Um Yeah, I don't know if you've got the executive power over this material, and to some degree they they don't because the if the rights are sold and then bought by somebody else, it's like there's only so much you can do because they bought the rights. Uh but I agree. There should have been more executive um decisions being made here and and uh refrain happening it's like hey we're not doing this hey you guys want to introduce gandalf in this way nope hey you guys want to have galadriel just be this raging barbarian who ends up you know talking with sauron being best friends with sauron and not knowing it no way nope not doing that there should have been some executive uh veto here but there just was not uh joshua josh showfield yeah. revolve i think i got that um orphan elrond Galadriel being the first one to find him too? Question mark. Uh, what? Also, if she could swim from Valinor to Middle Earth, <laughs> why could all the Noldor forget the Kinslay? Uh, <laughs> good questions, honestly. Um, the Orphan Elrond thing is felt weird because I don't think Galadriel was the first person to find him, but I do think that he was saying that she's the first person to talk to him after Elendil dipped. Um, yeah, but I don't know the the. They try to make Elrond feel like a tragic character after the loss of his father. But I don't feel like it's super befitting. Because I feel like every elf in Middle-earth would know that because of Elendil's actions, they get to live. And, you know, for that, I feel like, I don't know. I feel like they could have been done, it could have been written better. It couldn't have been oh, written yeah. like, you know... Elrond is praised uh, for his father's memory, 
but he still feels alone. But instead, it just kind of became this tool that Elrond uses at times to kind of quip back at Galadriel being like, oh, you've lost things, I've lost things too. Yeah. Um, I don't know, it kind of cheapened the experience for me. Yeah, I mean, Elrond, you have to think about it too. It's like Elrond, yeah, he's he came from a family of four, and he's the only one left in Middle-earth. His brother became the first king of Numenor, he's gone. His father's in the sky, and his mother's in Valinor as like a bird lady. <laughs> and he's he's the only one left and i don't know i mean could have been better written the, the swimming from valinor to, to middle earth that was the first time in the show at the end of the first episode where i was like uh-oh yeah this is this is gonna be a real the, the writing here doesn't make much sense uh william duan hypothetically do you think someone who's well versed in the lore would have a better time just watching the last episode no probably not you would be so thrown off by all of the changes uh, the, the seduction and fall of the Gwaith y Myrdain, of the, the jewel smiths of Oregion, it would, would be screen. like, what? Yeah, well, it, it, the, the part that happened on screen was like, hey, why don't you give this a try? Call it a gift. And it's like, oh, okay, okay, that's what we're doing. Uh, let's see. Halfwit, Tolkien's grandson is in the credits. This is true. He did act as consultant on the show to some to some degree i haven't looked much into that but that is true i wonder if he was the one giving veto power um or given the veto power and that's why he didn't bill c seems to think so saying uh the poison relationship between christopher and simon simon as a modernist could have cheered give me the meat i don't know a lot about simon so yeah i can't i sure. yeah i can't speak much to that either but it's <laughs> it's too bad if they let that that go through got to defend it you got to defend the works uh let's see william i'm doing a lot of the work for the writer here but what if sauron was on the raft because he escaped the judgment of the valar the sea monster was olmo ose going after sauron he picked up galadriel to use as a hostage that makes a lot more sense than what they I would mean, do but they don't have the sea right monster still sea monster still tried to kill galadriel true and and who are those other people as well uh that did die and they don't have the rights to olmo ose they don't have the rights to probably that moment with the judgment of the Valar. Maybe they could swing that to some degree, but I don't think they have that those rights. Uh, yeah, it's well, it's interesting because I I think one of the only Valar that they did have the rights to was Aule because they mentioned his name every like chance times. they got, but they didn't mention it. It became glaring the first couple times I heard it. I was like, that is awesome. They have the rights to the Valar. That's sweet. And then I realized. Oh, they only have the rights to the name of one of the Valar because they only say that name. They don't say the Elder King Manway. They don't say Elbereth Varda. They don't say uh, Yavanna, Olmo. You know, they don't see say any of these names. So no Tolkas. <laughs> no, no Tolkas. No, <laughs> no Mandos. Nothing like that. Uh, let's. Um. See. We haven't really talked a whole lot about Numenorean. We've been just trying to keep catch up with keep all these super yeah. chats. Let's but, do this uh, last one and then we'll we'll jump in. JMD Reed says, uh, thank, thank you for your super chat. Thanks for the honest reviews and defending Tolkien. Glad I found your channel. Something good came out of this dreck. Yep. I, I'm glad we could defend it as best we could. Thank you so much for watching. Ryan, what are your thoughts on Numenor? All right. So the Numenor plotline, you get started a little bit later with the introduction of Elendil, after picking up Galadriel and Halbrand, El Elendil is easily, I think, the best character associated with simply the Numenors, uh, the Numenorians. Um, nobody else really comes close. Isildur, is, he has not a lot of time, and the time that he has, he's mostly spent whining. Um, I felt that, oh, Farazhan. Farazhan is a great character so far. But honestly, I, I'm starting to suspect that I like Farazhan so much because he appears so infrequently. But when yeah. he does, he's he's usually making a, a pretty good scene, and I'm a, I'm a fan of him so far. Not his ideals, uh, sure. obviously, but <laughs> of, of, of that that actor, that performance, and that character so far. Tar Muriel was just back and forth for me. Um, it, it felt like every nope it felt like it depended on who was standing in the room with her on which side she was on but at the same time they didn't actually like write a story that kind of shows a weakness in her that would be attributed to that it didn't show her at being like you know a people pleaser as much it just kind of felt like she would just do whatever they needed to move the plot forward she would either be 
very antagonistic to Galadriel because they wanted to show the Numenorians being antagonistic to Galadriel. Yeah. They, they didn't do anything with that. Nope. And then later, you know, they have her won over without a whole lot of, you know, Galadriel basically broke into her sick dad's room. <laughs> and then because of that, Terminator was like, you know what? You're cool. I'll talk with you more. And then that will help you convince me. <laughs> yeah. Wow. You broke. Yeah. <laughs> For real. I don't know how that gains any trust. Uh, I, I agree. Like the, the Numenor stuff, some of it was, was interesting to see. Elendil and the actor, he did a good job. However, I just don't feel the Elendil from the books or too much, a, a ton of resemblance. Him being a petty lord, captain, uh, that was some, disappointing, honestly. It was. And and some you get the sense that he's some unearthed lord from the faithful and all this weird stuff. But the, how they were treating the faithful and the king's men made absolutely no sense to me. Our Farazan seemed to not act in accordance with the traditions of his father uh, or grandfather, Argimilzor. And he didn't, um, he didn't seem to act in the traditions of the king's men. I'm not sure where the strife is. They didn't really tell us. Uh, they treated Galadriel a lot better than I thought they would if they were all Kingsmen or, you know, but even the faithful treated her less well than I would have thought that they would have for being the faithful. Uh, let's see. The, yeah, that's something else I wanted to mention. When when they came to the throne room and they met Tarmiriel the first time, even, even the first time, multiple times, Tar Galadriel talked to Tarmiriel in such a disrespectful way. There's a scene from the last episode of, of House of the Dragon. <laughs> Sorry to keep bringing it up, but yeah, spoilers for, for this one. It's just such an interesting side-by-side -side to watch one stellar show a, a week and then, like, Rings of Power <laughs> later that week. In the last episode of, of House of the Dragon, they had this moment where a, a lord, he was talking back to the king, to the, to the Targaryen king, and dude, he that didn't end well. Let's just say he didn't have all of his head by the end of that <laughs> that scene. And I'm like, that's what would have happened to Galadriel in this moment with how she talked to to the Queen Regent and how she addressed the lords and ladies of Numenor. That she would not have probably made it out of that situation alive, or she would have just spent the rest of her uh, the rest of her elven years in a cell. It's just, yeah. it's. There was, it was, it felt like a ping pong with Tar um, yeah. on whether she was going to be cool or not cool to Galadriel. And there was no basis for what she was doing. I am, I have to mention that I'm kind of excited for where this storyline can go, just because I, I do enjoy this Numenorian storyline. And I do think, I say this now, I'm going to regret it. I think the Numenorian storyline is easy enough for them to do in a way that they can not make it bad but we'll see man we'll, we'll see, see. And, um, and it's and it's tough because <laughs> Numenor at this point and it's it's later lore if we look at the context of the books which is really again hard to do with this show uh if we look at the context of the books at this point in Numenor's place it's a really divided country it's really between the king's men who are the majority and then the faithful who are the minority and the faithful are being persecuted more and more with every king and they're being forced out of their lands replaced and and trying they're trying to the king's men are trying to push them to go to middle earth and leave numenor just in general but meanwhile in the show the only thing we see about numenor's people is that there are guilds exactly guild guilds but <laughs> here's here's where the issue comes in it's like Tolkien did not like allegory. He liked escapism. However, our world is so politically divided, not just in the United States, but in so many countries where I'm not sure they can do this plot line correctly because it's, it, do they keep it escapist? They really need to keep it escapist. Otherwise, it'll just be a reflection of our own politics and our own political divides. And that will just crush this show. It'll just raise further uh, toxicity in the fandom. And it's just, I'm not looking forward to that. We've already gotten a hint of that with some of our Farazan speeches. I won't go much into it, but some of how his speeches reflected what some politicians in real life have said and so forth. And it's like, uh-oh, right? Where are they going to go with... It? How are they going to do this? It should not mirror our own politics. It should not mirror our own world in that way because that's not what this story is about. Uh, really fast, Bill C., thanks again for a super chat. $50 million less for effects and more for buying rights of the first age in the universe, Arda and Ea. That's what I'm saying. Like, they really should have put I, more into the story and the lore. There, There's no way they would ever get 
the so, rights yeah. to the Silmarillion. So hoping for them is unfortunately just kind of a fool's hope. But um, I just, I don't, I, I want to try to get back to the Numenorians so that we can get to Galadriel and then we can get to like greater criticisms for the show at large. And yeah. Things that we Real f- prefer and things like that. Really but, fast. I wanted to mention this. So, um, Matthias, thank you so much for your super chat. Simon Tolkien actually criticized the Peter Jackson trilogy for being too accurate to the books. I haven't looked into that, but if that's true, that's awful. <laughs> uh, anyway, yeah, let's let's continue. All right, so I think with Numenor, we've kind of given a general gist, but generally, it, the the plot it was the most like action driven, I would say, kind of. Um, but at the end, well, I mean it. This one feels like where in, in the previous plot lines that we've talked about, I've kind of been railing on it for having no consequences. Um, this one feels like it will have some consequences. Uh, Tarmiel is now blind. And I think in some ways in a much weaker position after what most people would see as a failure, it was a failure um, yeah. to fix the Southlands. And now her father is dead, things like that. You know, interesting enough, for me to still, you know, be I like if I didn't watch season two, which I probably will end up watching season two, but if I didn't, I would be curious to be like, I wonder what happened with the new Minorian storyline. So sure. I guess that's yeah. if that's too. enough of uh, like a positive here. But other than that, I've talked about the problems that we've had. The biggest problem being, I think, Alendiel's character and acting. Good. Alendiel's like background in this in this universe is disappointing i would have liked him to be you know honestly just a bigger figure uh because of just who he is and who he's going to end up being so yeah Yeah. that's that's my thought on that and Uh, i'd like to move to galadriel you're cool with that yeah really fast just to give my last thoughts on numenor i i agree it's um it'll be interesting to see what happens and if they get that storyline right I'm really hoping that they don't continue to do a seal door dirty. I really have not liked his characterization thus far. I'm curious to see Anarian because I love that brotherhood between a seal door and Anarian in the, in the uh, lore itself, but hopefully they don't do to Anarian what they did to a seal door. And uh, yeah, I think that should, I think that should wrap that up. So yeah, let's jump into with Galadriel. <sighs> <laughs> so starting off, at the beginning, Galadriel's storyline was, it, you know, at, right out of the gate, it took a stumble. Um, yeah. <laughs> Galadriel, and this is the biggest criticism, and I will echo this as through through my review. Galadriel is a character that the writers want you to feel is powerful, is just, is smart, is right, and all of these things. Yet they refuse to show her being powerful, smart, right, and all these times. She's constantly being... Uh, second guest by other characters and for good reason she's constantly shown being brash arrogant um and at the very beginning we have her pushing her elves to their you know to the to the brink of death in what is to everyone's mind a wild goose chase um and she, she and she figures it out at the end and you know it's like oh Sauron went this way yeah all right cool and gosh it was so annoying it was so annoying to me that, that even even with that, I I my prediction was like, all right, they're gonna use this to she's gonna use this to like continue this plot line. But no, then she immediately gets basically banished. Yeah. <laughs> I, I felt like there were so many better ways that were less awkward than this whole ship scene with her. You know, it it, it lasted two episodes. She starts sailing west, second guesses it leaps to her death but not really um yeah <laughs> it's picked up on the raft by Hal Brandt, who immediately as soon as he was on screen you know everyone on the internet was like this is probably sauron right yeah this has got to be sauron and yeah. at that point i was like no nah, that can't be sauron yeah there's be no way, way. that'd be way too easy yeah way too easy um <laughs> Why, why would Sauron be out here? What's he doing out here? Yeah, what? Yeah, 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 absolutely. It's like the one place that she actually wasn't looking for Sauron. She found Sauron in the middle of the ocean. That happened to be, like, at her point in the middle of the ocean. It's got to be really hard without proper maps and compasses and, you know, 
iPhones to <laughs> to map your way through the ocean. But they didn't seem to have any of that. They were just out there. And then she also just was out there. And they have no explanation for the Valar bringing them together or for Iru, like, any greater fate or purpose. They were just, I mean, maybe greater fate that brought them together. But, like, why and how? And and just how it was so easy. So, yeah. I, yeah. I guess kind of getting away from what I'm, my, my thesis here is that the writers, they are under the, the delusion that they are writing a powerful uh, leader as a character when in reality they refuse to show her being a leader yeah every time we get a chance for her to lead something she either makes a terrible mistake or she gets second guessed by somebody and that's just it's annoying because yeah. i want this character to be good i want the character that they seem to think that they are writing but it's just not happening it's it's just not there there's nothing going on and every three episodes we have to watch galadriel prove herself through some feat of strength or skill yeah yet every time she has to talk to another character on the show the things that she says the annoying like it's so annoying she openly threatens Elendil for nothing Elendil did nothing to her <laughs> and she's like yeah. i will kill you here now i will stab you with this knife <laughs> yeah <laughs> she's uh it's so frustrating and from a storyline her showing up in numenor kind of interesting She's able to get a plot moving there. And of course it didn't work out uh, because Galadriel's not allowed to do something right in this show. No. Um, <laughs> not, not in, not in, uh, if this were, it not, if this were D and D not in a role play perspective, she's never allowed to do something completely exactly, right in a role exactly. play, but her combat, she's just cracked. She is min maxed in combat beyond anyone else. She would, I think I've said this in one of our reviews, Galadriel would be one of the most annoying D and D PCs to have at your table because she is just destroying every combat encounter around her. You you actually feel like the player is using weighted dice, but then when it comes to like any role play encounter, just it the worst. It devolves into angst and arguments. Yeah, and thrash. It's it just got really super tiring. Yeah, um, it's, yeah. Galadriel, for for her, her to be the protagonist of this. It, you know, in hindsight, it makes sense that they made this choice, but it's horrible that they made this choice for for her in this characterization. There should be more, uh, yeah, charisma. There, she wants to lead her own charisma. realm. Charisma is the biggest, like, Galadriel is supposed to be the greatest of yeah. elves at this point. Yet, there is no charisma. Forget the fact that all the other elves just think that she's hot-headed and dumb. Yeah, there's even the men that she meets are they're constantly second guessing her. They're constantly talking down to her, constantly lecturing her. Yeah, about things that she knows. <laughs> oh yeah, or sh rather should know, but I actually don't think she knows them for some reason. Uh, Mihovel P. Galadriel, thank you so much for your super chat. Galadriel was not or was the most powerful of Noldor after Feanor. Is not there as there is no Galadriel who read Feanor's heart, etc. I, I think I missed that, but. Uh, yeah, she was very powerful. At least in this time frame, she was very powerful. She, But she and Feanor never got along, which is what Bill C. comes into. Let's see. Uh, thank you for your super chat again. Her pride was unwilling to return. She burned with desire to follow Feanor with her anger. Pride moved her when she refused the pardon of the Valar. Or, yeah, the Valar. It was not long until... It was not until two long ages had passed that her wisdom was full grown. Okay, well... I don't know if we're talking, yeah, first and second. And also, you can be wise without being so unwise that you're almost, like, suicidal. Like she is in the show where she's jumping off of a raft, you know? I'm not, or, I'm not, asking, I'm not asking for the Galadriel that meets Frodo at the mirror. I'm asking for a character that has a grasp. <laughs> yeah. No, yeah, and this is what I mean. It's like she jumps off of a boat in the middle of the ocean. That's not just, like, unwise. That's just so unwise that you, it's, it, it, begs belief it's just incomprehensible how unwise and so there's a middle ground that's where i think she they should have brought her fighting prowess down a few notches and then brought her 
uh, humility, wisdom, intelligence, and charisma up a few notches to make her somewhere in the middle where it's like she's been alive for thousands of years and you can tell, but she's still, she's still trying to figure out She's trying to lead this herself, whereas in the age past against Morgoth, maybe she followed other kings. She followed Fingon and Fingolfin and all of this, but now she is the one that's trying to root out Sauron. And so she's actually pretty competent, pretty likable, but there are still some things she needs to learn, some things she's missing in the equation. That would have made for a far more interesting, compelling, and realistic character than what we got. Yeah, and I, I think there's a lot of fans who did like did not like the idea of her being a warrior. I am not one of them. I like the idea of Galadriel being a warrior. I just wish that she wasn't a, like a, a classic D and D barbarian, all, yeah. all brawn, no brains. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and in the end, they did try to kind of tone that down with her figuring out everything at the end. Yeah. Um, and man, did that, was that, did that not feel earned? Because it, for the entire show, as in the second episode, she expresses some doubts about Halbrand because she doesn't know who she is. She's like, why should I trust you? And it's like, and he's just like, because you really don't have a choice. And she's like, all right, cool, I can I can deal with that. Yeah. That 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 speaks to me. And for the rest of the show, she just takes everything he says at face value. He does exactly nothing that we see to rouse any suspicion in her, and yet. I mean, even when he does do things, like he fights a bunch of people in Numenor, even when that occurs, uh, she still just like, that. It, it's just dust in the window. She doesn't even, I don't even think she touches it on it. She she visits him in, in jail, but they don't even talk about the fight. They talk about her. Yeah. <laughs> and, so, <laughs> and so, yeah, like no suspicion whatsoever until the last moment where Keller Brimbor, who in you know he had been saying some some kind of prideful things yeah like, throughout the entire series so far he says one thing and then immediately it just clicks in her mind like oh my gosh Halbrand so yeah it's like <laughs> what <laughs> how'd you get that so quickly he's like I gotta check first though let me go talk to the most awkward looking and talking <laughs> elf in the series <laughs> that, that lore master felt weird to me yeah. I don't know that was Maybe that's mean, but no, that guy felt like that guy felt like a, a fence pole walking around. Um, <laughs> and she's like, "Let me go talk with this guy." And oh, you have you have the you have the the lineage of the kings of the Southlands just on on demand. It's like on it's like it's on Netflix for you. All right, cool. Yeah, yeah. Just get, get that back to me by the end of the day. Easy Wikipedia, um, <laughs> man. Easy. Uh. And and then she she reads it and she's just like, "Oh man." I've been goofed. I've, I've been, been hacked. Goofed. I've yeah. been, I've been bamboozled. Yeah. <laughs> oh, it's man. crazy. It was, and, and oh, sorry. Felt really cheap. It, it really felt really cheap that this reveal happened. Yeah, Halbrand. Um, Halbrand being Sauron again. It was so simplistic. Where I actually, for the longest time, I was like, "There's no way that they can go that easily with this." Because I, I also wondered. I was like, "Why would Sauron save Galadriel from drowning the first time he met her?" But apparently that was the case because he wanted her to be his queen. And uh, uh, that is just, I get that they're trying to do this Nietzsche, like almost philosophy of look within the shadow of yourself and the evil that you're attaining and fighting the evil that you are fighting and all of that kind of stuff. And that sh her darkness maybe is what Sauron in this show latched onto. But that is not the place. This isn't the place for that sort of storyline. Absolutely not. If Tolkien was alive to hear Galadriel, like Sauron is trying to seduce, literally seduce, not in any other term of, or way of, of the term, trying to seduce Galadriel into becoming his queen, I cannot imagine that Tolkien would be like, oh, okay, cool. Ah, uh, that, I'm that bad, I'm good. Yeah, no. yeah, and no way. It's like, it, you know, you could almost forgive him because apparently she's married and we just, you know, that just got randomly dropped into, what was it, episode six or seven? Yeah. Um, that, you know, she was just like, oh, I had a husband once and he's, <laughs> he's been gone for, for so long. I, and it, I, we talked about it in that episode. Apparently the way that she was talking about it, it kind of felt like she met Celebrimbor for the first time and he was wearing armor and then they were married. <laughs> and then they were married. All, <laughs> and then she like never that. saw him again. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like in, in one meeting. 
Yeah. Um, and yeah, I was just really, really, really annoyed that this whole this whole reveal plotline was feasible because they refused to give us anything with Kelleborn, who is a character yeah. that does not, you know, that old Monty Python bit. Sir, not appearing in this. Sh- in this yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. His literal like, presence would have fixed like half the plot of season one for Galadriel. Yeah, yeah I just, I really, really dislike. I, you know, I feel like the Galadriel plotline could be done so well, and they could still have their strong leader protagonist being Galadriel. Yeah, it's just it was done so poorly. It was to the point where she was she was strong. Oh, she, was she strong? Did we get to see that? <laughs> yeah. Like three times that she had to fight somebody. Super strong, yeah. Uh, Bill C says, in her youth, Tolkien said she was an Amazon, ouch, but true, who wove her hair and who wore her hair in braids and athletics. Young Galadriel's mother name was indeed Narwin. Yeah, she can, again, she can be strong, and I don't think that's so much of a problem. Um, like, it's not a problem really at all, because she's powerful, so it makes sense that to some degree, being the granddaughter of high king fienwe that she would have some athletic ability and some warrior ability and everything like that but what we do know about galadriel is that she wanted to rule her own realm that she wanted to be a strong leader and and a queen or a lady of sorts and how would you do that if you weren't at all charismatic if you weren't all at all wise or even intelligent to some vast degree uh bill also says compression strikes again galadriel mad with rage at the kinsling up to galadriel who doubts anatar in one season totally absolutely uh nerwin i can't type man maybe yep yeah so it's it's a weak part of the show and uh, yet another one uh so i think that's a good place to lead us into our final kind of reviews of the season at large ryan if that if that works for you yeah okay i want to talk about sauron <laughs> yeah 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 okay let's let's do it sauron is told not shown to be a villain series yeah and everybody knows that Sauron's a bad guy because of you know the lord of the rings but all that we've seen from Halbrand is not earned um in the in the eighth episode all of the fear is not it's not shown it's told um you know yeah. show show don't tell is like the oldest the, old, the oldest rule in filmmaking oh, and wait. um we are told that she, her, her brother was lost uh, and it was Sauron's fault. <laughs> and man, like af- out- outside of that, what did he do? He fought with Morgoth in the past, but yep. so did the men of the Southlands. So, And the whole that he was like trying to heal, uh, it, that was most likely a lie, right? Uh, he was trying to heal the world. And yeah. he had been it was, suffering. It was a lie. It was a lie. And, you know, they talked about, like, oh, we want to make Sauron more, uh, what was what was the term, Joyston? Uh More humanized or something? I don't remember. Yeah, I don't remember. It, what they did instead was they just didn't show him at all. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> and, like, I, I feel like that character could have been given more justice. It could have been better the reveal could have been better earned as it stands right now i just you know they revealed him as sauron like immediately you know the moment he, uh, i i suspected he was sauron starting like a long time ago yeah. but um you know when i actually knew they were sauron and he dropped that gift line i was just like yeah okay <laughs> yeah um, sounds man, right. i wish i cared yeah <laughs> that I this wish, like i wish i wish i felt a level of betrayal that i'm seeing on galadriel's face but in reality he just hasn't done anything yeah the, <laughs> yeah he's he, he's not this really super fair for it's weird that again being a man talking to elves about the ring craft and seducing them that way that he was just this sweaty ranger man versus like you know a high elf or look uh, an elf looking character that we've seen and I imagine it's probably just to keep the same actor. I imagine Halbrand is like the same one when he returns to Numenor, if they go that route for the downfall, that he still looks like Halbrand and all of that kind of stuff. But it's weird that they chose to reveal that he was the Lord of Gifts in the same episode as they revealed that he was straight up Sauron. Like, it would have been interesting, even if that was the case of like, is this the Lord of Gifts, right? In one episode to another. And then it's like, oh yeah, this is the Lord of Gifts. This is probably Sauron. And then, yep, yeah, this is Sauron. They, they chose to make that reveal in the same episode. 
and to really hammer that one home. But he just doesn't feel like Sauron. Not at all. <laughs> His actions, they're trying to humanize him way in this weird, weird degree. He does not feel like he is Sauron, but he certainly feels like Amazon is trying to tell me that he's Sauron. Yeah, and that's, you know, that's that's a pretty big detriment to me. And gosh, I just, I wish there was more to that character. And with all the time that, you know, every episode, there's eight episodes, they all feel like they take an eternity. Yeah. And still <laughs> we didn't get enough of the characters that I liked. So, yep, <laughs> yeah. Totally. Um, more things, like throughout the entire series, I talked a lot about this uh, when we did our episode eight review last night, but it just, it was throughout the entire show. There was the constant, it was, it goes beyond just simple teleportation. Ah, uh, season eight of game of Thrones, like where everybody's teleported across the map. They are, but that's, that is a symptom of a greater issue, which is that we have, this show sets us up for a journey. And I don't mean like a literal journey of people moving, although that does qualify. I mean, like a plot journey, a, thing that happens over time they yeah. set us up for them and then they skip the journey mm -hmm. to arrive at the destination constantly it's <laughs> most easily seen with the harfoots yeah. as they are actually literally journeying across middle earth but we see them prepare for their migration and then we see them at the end of their migration we see nothing in the middle except like we this see... montage right where they're traveling and then we come to find that the destination is not all that interesting anyway because without the journey the destination really is nothing Yes. So, you know, Galadriel, like she's constantly being set up for, you know, OK, this is what her story is going to be for the next, you know, however long. And however long that turns out to be is 15 minutes of screen time, because that yeah. then we're already at, at at the end of that. And we're starting up a brand new journey that will last that that won't ever that won't even happen. We'll get skipped over. That is the problem with this show is that there is no build there is nothing that is happening this is why people who aren't fan of lord of the rings are not interested in this show it's because they don't feel any desire to continue yeah because it doesn't feel there real. is doesn't feel... <laughs> yeah it does not feel like a like a it does not feel like a story at all yeah it feels like uh you know a it feels like a timeline almost yeah it feels like a product for sure like, Am no, amazon like go... ships broad uh, it, it, they ship products, and this is one of the products, right? This is just like buying something else off Amazon. Yeah, it, but think about it. Like, if you've ever gone and you've read a timeline about something, yeah. it's like date and event. And so in this show, it's like at this date, Galadriel left uh, Middle Earth um, on the boat. At this next date, she decided not to. But but <laughs> also, <laughs> it's not even as good as a basic timeline. Because Royan, let me ask you, how when did how long was she on the boat? How long did know. she exactly. swim? How we don't, long? We don't know like, any of these things. Yeah, it's like a question mark, question mark, question mark instead of a date, and then a line, and then it says Galadriel leaves. Question mark, question mark, question mark. Galadriel stops, and then you know. But yeah, forget <laughs> the physical time differences. Yeah. let's go into the character difference. Like we start, and she's angry about uh, she's angry but accepting about leaving, and then at some point she decides to jump off, but we don't get to see what's happening to her. We don't get to see events don't happen. She stares at the camera and we can assume that she is like making a decision. And then she jumps off the ship. Yeah. <laughs> we don't, you know, in, in television, you, you, you know, in a, if you're writing a book, you can, you can write out her thoughts and you can, you can follow the story of that line. But in television, at the end of the day, all we saw was Galadriel staring at, staring off the off the distance for five to ten seconds and then jumping off a ship and yeah. that's just not it's not very interesting it's there's not. no journey there there's just a destination and an arrival yeah so let's go through the super chats that we've gotten and then we can kind of start wrapping things up about the season at large Rizali, thank you so much for the super chat season two spoiler is tell a no telenovela i haven't watched that show with gala sauron and Celeborn. so if anyone gets that reference but i imagine it's probably not something good pertaining pertaining to Celeborn. uh bill c some of anatar's seduction moral remained thus she needed to pass the test again with frodo 
I think we can do that with a more personal element with a character arc, like what happens with Galadriel in the books versus the literal su seduction by Sauron um, here. And then Richard says, Adar was the only interesting character for me. Kind of. For me, it's like we didn't get enough. And he was definitely there to tease Sauron rather than being Sauron himself. He was there simply to have the orcs, like, ha have a leader. Pretty follow much. a yeah. leader, follow but it's a not leader. Sauron. Yeah, no, a little bit of misdirection. And I, I predict that he will be dealt with by the end of the first episode. You know, it's oh, just yeah. another instance of us setting something up and then it's over with in, yeah. in the blink of an eye. <laughs> yeah, Sauron. And that's... I mean, yeah, that's why Sauron and Halbrand was, like, so hardcore towards Adar where he comes out of nowhere on his horse in episode six and just, like, almost kills Adar. But then he still listens to Galadriel, so we'll see him probably just destroy Adar next episode and steal Mordor from out from under Adar. Uh, again, I wish Sauron himself had been the one to build, rebuild Mordor, everything like that, versus him just stealing Adar and Adar's orcs. Okay. Uh, it definitely, this season definitely humanizes orcs too much in my opinion um and it's it, it, for other characters for other things in this world that's totally fine to humanize but the orcs are meant to be the the soulless husks of elves that morgoth has corrupted and they're soul they're i think literally soulless because elves could choose if their bar if their bodies underwent so much torment to just leave their bodies uh their fea fear could just go outside of their horror and that could literally happen. So these, in my mind, orcs aren't meant to be these humanized creatures. Sure, there there are maybe some human elements or some comedy that's even played in the books with them. Um, but I, I don't think that this was the right way to go with those guys. Rabbi Radagast says, Joystin's new PFP. Uh, smiling on our... Ah, uh -huh, yes. <laughs> so, uh, thank you. Smiling on our running horse. Thank you. <laughs> Heck yeah. Uh, Bill C., thank you so much for another super chat. Initially disliked Hal Brand equals Sauron, but it did solve my long-standing question. How could so many high elves think, oh yeah, Anatar, that really powerful elf we never knew. There are being so many. Sure, that's a fair point, but the thing with Anatar is I think he, he posed himself to be a messenger from Valinor, like this uh, emissary of the Valar. He posed himself to be someone that they really hadn't met, but somebody powerful that came from the West. And that could work because they've been away from Valinor for so long that perhaps this was just some child amongst the Vanyar or the, the Noldor that they hadn't met. Uh, William Duan, thank you so much. Which is better, GOT Season 8 or Rings of Power Season 1? I have to say Rings of Power. Uh, Jones had a lot of problems yeah. with... I mean, this one... Obviously, Rings of Power is more personal to me. Yeah. But Game of Thrones was just purely bad in every facet the storylines that they had been building whereas in rings of power they like to build and then just kind of drop the these storylines have been building for seven long seasons and they did end but they ended and they fell flat yeah there's constant camera and lighting issues so that the, the most interesting scenes either were too bright or not bright enough Rings of Power is at the at the end of the day. Rings of Power is gorgeous. It's beautiful. True. And True. whether or not that is enough to overcome its flaws is up to the individual viewer. I would think. Um, yeah. At the very but, at the very least, it's like Game of Thrones. I would agree with you. Actually, season eight of Game of Thrones was worse. Barely. It's close for me, but I would say season eight was worse because it went against the characters that previous seasons had built. At least this one, even though it went against the lore, they're building their own characters to at least be consistent internally somewhat, right? There are problems with that too, as we talked about, but at least internally consistent within the Rings of Power universe. Um, Marcus Aurelius says, none of these characters are all that likable. For sure. I agree. I was thinking about that today. It's like this, that's part of the problem of this show is I don't really idolize any of these characters. I don't really care. Even Arondir, I'm like, yeah, you're cool and you, you get it. But I, you haven't done enough. You haven't been there enough for me to be like that guy, you know? Uh, Maholvel P says, whole secret of rings, of really rings was making an alloy. Yep. Apparently so. <laughs> And it was, it was just, it wasn't even like an, it was the, it was an alloy of gold, silver, and mithril. Yeah. And it was just a lot of gold, a lot of silver, and a little bit of mithril. So, you know. And that. sure, that was an interesting symbolic moment of like, hey, it has to be your dagger. So then you have this thematic change of, you're not so much the warrior, you got to let go of the vengeance and the warrior aspect and become something greater with these rings. 
sure, I kind of like that, but they put more emphasis on the dagger than Galadriel. Like, the characterization of the dagger than Galadriel throughout this show. <laughs> so, the Frozen One, thanks for thanks for the super chat. Uh, William Duan, maybe MM is not Gandalf, and Follow Your Nose is just some part of standard issue Middle-Earth survival guide that all the Astari got before they left. <laughs> Uh, we had a little bit of discussion about whether or not Ansel Boren. I think that is still kind of left up in the air, whether it was um, a weirdly accented or lying or a weirdly accented messed up a Lauren. Um, yeah. But I think it would be awkward. it Because it, in the previous parts of the show, they had used these, uh, they had used previous lines to just kind of like draw connections from Peter Jackson to characters in the show with, yeah. you know, Poppy just, just attending to sort of be like Samwise, um, but and other things like that. I don't know. I feel like I I personally, I really didn't want him to be Gandalf, uh, but I think he is. Yeah. And I guess we'll see. <laughs> yeah, I'm right there with you. Um, last Super Chat before we start to put our final wraps on the season. Bill C., uh, thanks again. Orcs caused Catholic Tolkien pause, beings beyond redemption. I've heard, yeah, I've heard about that, and I've, I've looked into that a bit. I think, at least for me, my understanding and interpretation of how Tolkien landed on that was with that Fayar Shora sort of moment. I don't know if I could even really, in a, in a real metaphysical sense, consider orcs to be beings in Tolkien's works. I feel the same way about dragons, to be honest. I don't think dragons in Tolkien's works are beings with free will, with the flame imperishable, Rather, I feel like they are husks of the greater power that control them. They're almost like, here's here's some dark power. Like, we're going to torture and pervert these elves. We're going to take out the things that make them beings, the, the free will and all that kind of stuff. We're going to throw darkness into them to make them not really, re not redemptive beings and not even beings that really truly have a, a greater sense of free will, like men, dwarves, elves, hobbits, uh, ants to some degree. Yeah, that's how that's how I kind of that's my take on that. Uh, is you can you can parse out orcs to not really be true beings. So, uh, alrighty, so we got some, we got some more super chats. <laughs> Ryan's clacking away. <laughs> you're good. I, I think I might have to meet you. <laughs> all right, I I I, I'll, I'll, I think I'm done talking. Oh, okay, fine. no, you're good. That was. I, I, Travis Happy was like, I think it was a joke. I think Meteor Man is going to be the bartender at the Prince's Podium. To that I say, put some respect. Yeah. Barlamin Bar <laughs> Let's go. <laughs> Barlamin is a hero. <laughs> no. um, um, all right. So to kind of wrap things up, my, my voice is starting to go. So <laughs> yeah, we got we to kind of wrap this up. Sorry, guys. Um, but So overall ratings. So we went through our more or less overall dislikes and likes for the full season. So let's... Let's look at our overall ratings. So I, earlier on, I, I was trying to generally aggregate. This isn't exactly perfect. If people want, they can go back and like look at the exact scores I gave. But out of that 80, right, if we're going to aggregate 10 out of 10, or like 0 through 10 out of 10 for every episode, which would mean 80 for 8 episodes, my overall score, aggregating them together, was around like a 25 out of 80 for this show, which is not great at all. And that's about where I would put the season. I would give the season a 2.5 out of 10-ish or maybe a 3 out of 10 to for the whole season. I think I'm sitting at about a 3 out of 10 for the whole season. What do you think, Ryan? Uh, yeah, so I, I did not go back and review my actual scores, but I tried to remember them. <laughs> um, and I'm pretty <laughs> sure it added up to about like a 34 out of 40, which kind of makes or sense. Or out of 80. Yeah, sorry, at 80, as I remember it, which kind of, you know, kind of tracks with my general feeling. Um, I do think that the show is probably lower than that. I would give it, yeah, overall, it's interesting to me because I enjoyed the episodes more as they came out than I yeah. did the entire, the whole product. And I think that is telling more to the ways that, the things that I was enjoying, they ended up being small and insignificant. And the things that I didn't like ended up being built upon. And that those became the more major parts of the season. In addition, I did I still feel like my my journeys thing that I've been kind of harping on now for the second day in a row. <laughs> it's just it's it's so disappointing to me. It's it's 
it's really bad writing. I really feel like this was written by, um, what, like 15 people in a room yeah. paid for by Amazon. It felt pretty soulless. It did not feel like we had a central vision. Each plot line, but there's so much whiplash between the two, the plot lines and their, their feelings. I mean, what, ep what episode was that where we were with the, the, that was episode seven, I think with the burning, village after the eruption and then we just hard cut to oh, it's just hanging out <laughs> episodes <laughs> uh six i want to say like man i just constantly i was feeling like every time we were starting to build a little bit of momentum i would either be torn away or let down by them suddenly dropping that story um yeah and so yeah i would actually probably put this at about a three out of ten overall, yeah. an argument could be made for three and a half or four. Um, I think for me, a three out of ten is like my top most. Uh, two, yeah, I'm think I'm somewhere between a two and a three for uh, the whole season. But yeah, I'm right there with you. It's no, I'm actually, I'm, I think I'm gonna go. You know, because at the end of the day, this show, could, I can still, I still feel like I can go back to the show and pull some screen caps to make some really pretty wallpapers. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> sure. And although, you know, if, if most people probably don't care about that, but, <laughs> uh, <laughs> but I do. And so yeah. I'm probably going to go with a three and a half. Room. Okay. Yeah, no, that's fair. And the visuals were very beautiful. Now I think some held up much better than others. Uh, some of the shots in Numenor kind of were great. Some weren't as good at like a, at a, when, when the camera was further back, I noticed. Uh, but yeah, visuals were great. The music was a disappointment for me for sure i i really respect and like bear mccreary uh obviously love howard shore but howard shore was a lot less involved with this project than i thought he was going to be i think he just made that like uh opening theme rather or, or at least had a hand in that opening theme and then the rest was bear mccreary i didn't really care all that much for the soundtrack at large but the visuals were nice it's the writing that was either absent or completely mis mismanaged uh the direction that was off uh yeah so that for me it's i uh, yeah i think if i'm sitting at about like a two and a half out of out of ten so that is that's where we're at uh look at looking at the poll so you guys did a poll of like 14 up oh, and now it's gone it's about 1400 oh, votes it came at it came in at the bottom so oh it came in at the bottom okay uh the polls overall say 76 percent of you did not like uh, rings of power season one overall 23 percent said that they did like season one overall i if i were to vote right it's just a very broad thing i would say no of course uh, anything probably less than a five or out of ten i would say no uh, or or six out of ten is probably no so yep there is there's that that is season one of rings of power and i'm glad to be taking a break from this show absolutely for a while i've said it before like I'll say it again, if this show was canceled, I'm I'm okay with that. I I I'm that. aboard. Yeah, yeah. I I would kind of be glad to to hope that maybe in the future we would get. I know maybe this is idealistic or ignorant or something. I would hope that this failure, if it was canceled, would bring about a much better and more faithful adaptation of the Second Age. I am yeah i'm on board for this show being canceled for sure i'm going to continue to watch and review it however as long as i've got this channel and and uh for that i'm i'm thankful because i want to be able to use this platform to give a defense of tolkien as i as i see it uh same with royan he's f free to join me as long as he sees fit uh but we want to use we want to <laughs> yeah no, use this I, platform I love doing it thanks for thanks for bringing me in i think that we do end up having great discussions that i think are are, are useful for some people who yeah. maybe um are undecided on whether or not they want to watch or you know people who have watched i think they enjoy the discussions that we have so i, I definitely yeah. see value in us continuing to, Me to watch it and of course i absolutely i love doing this with you and i it's it's such an honor to come onto the channel anytime i i'm allowed to yeah absolutely man absolutely um, it's so good having you thank you so much for joining me through this um yeah, it's definitely made the show watching process and reviewing process a lot better. So thank you again. Uh, yeah, in terms of this show overall, 
it, again, it doesn't deserve to have an echo chamber of purely positive feedback. I've gotten that comment many times of, if you don't like it, don't watch it. But in that case, then only it's only getting positive reviews if everyone who didn't like the show doesn't watch it and doesn't review it. So I'm going to continue to watch it, going to continue to review it for as long as I've got this platform and everything like that. And uh, yeah, going to try to give the criticism, defend Tolkien where I can, and, and ask for the show to be better, that as it should be. It should absolutely have been better than this. And I'm very disappointed in it. I'm very disappointed in Amazon for, for doing the, it this way. In terms of future seasons, I think elements can be recovered. I think if they made the characterizations truer they they maybe do a hard cut which in terms of the logistics of writing and continuity could be weird if they do a hard cut bring Celeborn back bring Kyrdan back make Galadriel a lot more like she should be do these things to reorient the characters and the setting and the story to the actual lore there might be positive more positive seasons there might be better seasons they cannot recover this season one, no matter how much they retcon, though, without a full clean slate being being given. So that's that's my final thoughts on, on that. Ryan, what do you think about future seasons? I mean, I, I still think that this show is going to be canceled after three seasons. Mm -hmm. um, that's my prediction based on the way that it's performing. Um, I, at the end of the day, it's it's pretty clear to me that Amazon wants this to be a business model for them and obviously it, it was never going to be a passion project and i can't like just hold it to that but it, it does kind of feel like they were trying to make something so generic that it ended up being bad and that's kind of what i got so i don't expect there to be a ton of changes over all the seasons obviously the storylines will begin to mature but as i've you know harped on i don't think that this writing room has the ability to write a story that feels like it lands correctly. I, yeah. I don't think they have that. They have not shown to me the ability to write a journey. And so I don't expect that this will be very much better. So, yeah. Yeah, um, I agree. I agree. Yeah, so. I, so I think after season three, with the performance that it's getting and how it's being outperformed by other shows of its time, honestly, it had a decently weak... I, I can't think of a whole lot of other shows, with the exception of uh, Dance of the, uh, the exception of the House of the Dragon. I felt like it came at a pretty good time for it to, you know, it's there's not a whole lot of other good shows out there that are airing right now. There's a, there's a ton of good shows that are in between seasons, but with yeah. the exception of House of the Dragon, and still it refu it, it, it it failed to make it a cultural impact. So I think Amazon will view it as a failure the second season two is already going through i think they'll renew it for one more and then they'll they'll drop it totally yeah no i i agree and that's what i'm hoping for for sure uh so maybe in the future we get something better so uh to our super chats that we weren't able to address sorry about that but thank you so much we did read through them as much as we could and the support for the channel is absolutely appreciated as is your commentary i'm gonna obviously try to keep the chat for the when i post this live stream the chat should be there as well so hopefully people in the future will also be able to see that when they when they come to watch this review so my friends thank you all so much for joining us uh, i'm gonna thank our valor tier patrons really fast Royan, i gotta thank you first though again thank you so much man for being here i appreciate it hey thanks thank you so much for having me and uh yeah i'm just happy to be here and it's been thank you so much for the audience for watching and you know hope to see you all soon absolutely if you'd like to support the channel please consider getting some candles from our friends mythology candles through the link in the description below or check out our merch or patreon thanks to our valor to patrons peter shepherd jonathan putin and mark kralik blair scout and merton john hume sam mcb matt sabach elizabeth calvert maz gibbs reese jenkins adam petrolick brandon glidden molly sullivan daniel burns anthony Harmon, dorwin gray arthur merlin dj vaught and dale davis thank you so much to all of our patrons and youtube members my friends, thank you all so much for joining us, uh, not only in this live stream, but throughout the whole season, as well as this live stream too. My friends, thank you all so much for joining us on this adventure. Until the next one.